Our next keynote presentation will be given by Dr. Jeffrey Reber. Dr. Reber is the chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of West Georgia. His work is rooted in the field of relational psychology, which treats the relationships as fundamental to our knowing, to our being, and to our morality. In 2014, Dr. Reber served as the president for the Society of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology. Dr. Reber has written recently uh, books that specialize in treating growing so societal issues and concerns like narcissism and perfectionism from a relational perspective that interfaces with psychology, philosophy, and theology. Dr. Reber today will discuss how global crises, both past and current, may prompt social scientists to critically examine their assumptions about what it means to be human. Thank you, Zach, for that introduction, and thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, a special thank you to the organizers of this conference, which I think is a really necessary, important uh, topic for us to discuss. My topic today will be the effect of crises on uh, rethinking psychological assumptions about altruism and agency. Crises, and particularly global crises, have not only profoundly impacted society, but also the work of many social scientists. And in many cases, revelations concerning the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of people involved in a crisis have compelled many social scientists to take a hard look at their own theoretical assumptions. World War I, for example, cast combat trauma into bold relief on a scale that had never been witnessed before, but it also revealed the ineffectiveness of the prescribed treatments of the time which focused almost exclusively on physical symptoms and were often brutal. The ineffectiveness and questionable morality of these treatments in the face of a massive number of veterans needing treatment for the horrible and debilitating symptoms of what was then commonly referred to as shell shock prompted some of the people treating these veterans to rethink the dominant treatment assumptions, to question their own approach to treatment, and to develop alternative talking therapies which proved to have greater success and ultimately became important precursors for the treatment of PTSD today. A similar re-examination of assumptions about trauma has followed in the wake of the global crisis of the Second World War. Dr. Avi Sagi Schwartz, a developmental psychologist and professor emeritus at the University of Haifa, the son of a Holocaust survivor and a research fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, with whom I have become acquainted, has published several studies challenging the commonly accepted assumption of genetics research and social science that trauma shortens lifespan, showing, for example, that Polish Jewish male Holocaust survivors who emigrated to Israel after the war outlived their same aged male peers who emigrated before the war by as much as 18 months. Dr. Saggy Schwartz also conducted a study and a meta-analysis, which show that contrary to the long accepted theory and popular belief that trauma is transmitted to children and grandchildren, that Holocaust survivors did not transmit their trauma to their children or to their grandchildren, and that instead these second and third generation survivors, quote, exhibit the same normative behaviors as those who are not children of grandchildren, uh, children or grandchildren of survivors, end quote. Both of these lines of research have led him to postulate a theory of traumatic growth that sharply contrasts with prevailing theories of traumatic weakening, recognizing that resistance to change can, that can mark our discipline. Dr. Saggy Schwartz states, quote, it was clear to us that our results would be viewed with skepticism. One specific theory has been accepted for years, and it is difficult for people to accept a new theory. We know that people working in the field who are used to the old theories and popular beliefs will have difficulty accepting the conclusions of this research. But additional research done in other parts of the world has yielded similar results." End quote. These two examples, like others I will be sharing today, demonstrate that crises as horrific, devastating, and unwanted as they are, are uniquely capable of bringing about, sometimes compellingly, significant changes in social scientific research, not only in the topics examined, but also in the assumptions that inform the discipline and its dominant theories. Crises are like social and psychological microscopes 
that magnify and bring into bold relief aspects of the human condition and questions about human identity, character, and relationships that might otherwise be difficult to observe, study, and understand. They often reveal things about us that challenge our accepted worldview, and they can promote a re-examination of our assumptions in a way that laboratory studies rarely can. Because they happen in our lived world, and they happen at a global level that impacts many people. In this sense, they are empirical at the highest level because so many people directly observe and experience the crisis and its effects on people, making it difficult for theories to survive that fail to fit the data of that experience. It is perhaps too early to predict how our current crisis will prompt psychologists and other social scientists to re-examine their assumptions about human being. But we can look back at the effects of previous crises on the discipline to gain some possible insight into the general features of humanity that crises magnify. As a trained social psychologist, I am very familiar with one obvious example of a past crisis that fund fundamentally altered my field of study, which is the Second World War. Indeed, many social psychologists have said, and not at all in jest, that Adolf Hitler had a greater impact on the development of modern scientific social psychology than perhaps any other person. What social psychologists mean when they say this is that the crisis of World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust that took place under Hitler's reign over much of Europe powerfully impacted and altered social psychologists' thinking and instigated a profound shift of emphasis in their work that continues today. As is so often the case with crises, the attention of social psychologists in the aftermath of World War II, along with the general public, was drawn initially to the more shocking and horrifying stories and accounts of morally reprehensible behaviors. This may again be the case with the current crisis. Indeed, some of the first stories reported by the news when the virus spread beyond China, China's borders were of people hoarding hand sanitizer and surgical and respirator masks for the purpose of selling them at exorbitant prices. The popular media made us aware of increases in domestic abuse under quarantine, and we have heard about violent physical assaults on people who fail to practice social distancing. We have been inundated with stories of ill-informed and seemingly dangerous decisions made by national, state, and provincial governments, and many uh, have been outraged by the revelation of U.S. senators who dumped stocks before the March market crash occurred based on their privileged information. It is difficult not to be attracted first to the most disturbing behaviors during a crisis as they threaten to reveal something unsavory or immoral about us that could perhaps manifest in any person under the right conditions. Theodore Adorno and his colleagues were so, so deeply disturbed by the horrifying consequences of eliminationist anti-Semitism and not Nazi fascism in World War II that they set about developing an instrument known as the F scale, the F standing for fascism, that was designed to detect personality markers that would demonstrate a person's inclination toward authoritarianism, as well as their propensity for right-wing ideology, anti-Semitism, and ethnocentrism. Equally concerned and puzzled by the participation of so many people in the atrocities of the Holocaust, but also worried that many social scientists like Adorno put too much emphasis on personality, social psychologist Solomon Ash conducted studies in the mid-1950s of normative conformity in the United States that revealed a surprisingly high percentage of public conformity despite private disagreement with a unanimous group. At the same time, Leon Festinger demonstrated that cognitive dissonance following a behavior that contradicted an attitude could lead people to change their attitude to align with their behavior and thereby justify their immoral behavior. Stanley Milgram conducted a set of experiments beginning in 1961 designed to demonstrate that just about anyone under the right conditions could be persuaded to obey an authority to the point of injuring or possibly killing another person. A decade later, Philip Zimbardo conducted a study of perceived power at Stanford University by assigning participants to the roles of guards or prisoners in a mock prison environment. Based on his disconcerting findings from this and other studies, 
and his work as an expert witness at Abu Ghraib, Zimbardo developed a social psychological theory of evil that seeks to explain how easy it can be for seemingly nice people to turn bad. Out of these studies and countless others have come some insights and many more questions about the capacity of human beings to behave in surprising and frightening ways. These questions continue to profoundly influence the discipline and popular culture. Many social psychologists have re-examined their assumptions about human beings and their capacities for evil in ways that never would have occurred to them absent this horrible global crisis. As has been the case with our discipline's general proclivity to focus on the negative aspects of psychology first, it has taken a psychologist a longer time to re-examine their assumptions about human being in light of the positive aspects of psychology that are revealed in times of crisis. The research I cited earlier concerning traumatic growth was only conducted in, conducted in the last decade, and psychological research on the possibility of altruism in light of the activities of rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust did not receive notice in any significant way until Samuel and Pearl Oliner published the book, quote, The Altruistic Personality, Rescuers of Jews in Nazi Europe uh, in 1988. Yet, as positive psychologists and humanistic psychologists before them repeatedly remind us, the positive aspects of our humanity are also of utmost importance, and they too can be revealed and magnified in times of crisis, to a degree that cannot be seen in standard laboratory studies. In the current crisis, uh, this focus on the positive is exemplified by John Krasinski's web ser uh, series, Some Good News which Krasinski states, quote, is a news show dedicated entirely to good news, end quote, that is from around the world in the time of COVID-19. Uh, His first show garnered 30,000 subscribers, and now after only seven, well, now eight episodes, he has over two million people who subscribe to the web series. Krasinski opened his first episode by stating, quote, we are all going through an incredibly trying time, but through all the anxiety, through all the confusion, all the isolation, and all the Tiger King, somehow the human spirit found a way to break through and blow us all away." End quote. As his show and its overwhelming popularity demonstrate, crises can provide a form of empirical evidence of positive behaviors on a large, even global scale. And that evidence can challenge prevailing assumptions and theories about human nature, and human being, though perhaps not as immediately as the negative features. One of these positive features of human being that has been magnified in times of crisis to such a degree that a number of psychologists and social scientists have taken note of it, and in some cases have been prompted to rethink their assumptions, is the possibility of altruistic motivation. We are used to hearing about the possibility of altruism these days, it's covered in every contemporary social psychology text and in many introductory psychology texts. It is covered in every, um, it is covered in many um, news outlets as well. But altruism was not a topic covered in the first three editions of the Handbook of Social Psychology, published in 1938, 1954, and 1968, respectively. This omission was due in large part to the dominance of the assumption of egoism in the discipline. As indicated by Wallach and Wallach, who published a book on egoism in 1983 and reported that at that time, all theories of psychology and psychotherapy were fundamentally egoistic with almost no exceptions. Yet somehow, in the 1985 edition of the Handbook of Social Psychology, a chapter on altruism and aggression showed up. And in the 1998 edition, a full chapter dedicated to altruism and helping behavior was included. What changed to bring about the inclusion of this topic in the primary handbook of the subdiscipline? One major change was the emergence of studies examining the behavior of rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust. As exemplified by the aforementioned book by the Oliners and Kristen Renwick Monroe's book, The Heart of Altruism, which was published in 1995. No less important was the increased popular media attention paid to the rescuers at this time, especially the publication of the book Schindler's Ark in 1982, 
which Steven Spielberg turned into an Academy Award-winning movie in 1993. The Rescuers themselves, a notoriously reticent group, who almost universally did not deem their rescuing behaviors as extraordinary, allowed people like Spielberg and the Shoah Foundation, as well as the newly dedicated United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, to interview them and capture their stories and to publish their biographies. In some cases, they were even willing to publish their memoirs. This increased attention on the actions of rescuers during the crisis of the Holocaust called into question the nearly e universal egoistic theories of helping behavior of that time. How did this calling into question unfold? First, as I have previously asserted, crises have a unique ability to magnify features of our humanity, which allows us, and in some cases compels us, to take a closer look at them, to see what limitations and possibilities might be involved in something like human motivation and decision making. Under normal circumstances, we can see evidence of helping behavior all around us, but it is very difficult to infer the motivation behind that helping behavior when it is a common socially normative behavior. 50 people may walk by a Salvation Army representative ringing a bell outside a store during the holidays and put money in the can for a myriad of reasons that one could only guess. However, during a crisis, the possible motives entailed in helping behavior, including possible altruistic motives, often become more pronounced and narrow as the conditions become more consequential and severe. Consider the possible motives behind the actions of a young Polish woman named Irena Gut, who secreted 16 Jews out of the ghetto in the town where she lived just before they were deported for extermination and hid them in the basement of a villa where she worked as the housekeeper for an SS major who lived on the main floor directly above the Jews' hiding place. Irena did this action knowing that if she was caught, not only would she be executed, but according to the Nazi policy of kith and kin, her family, who was not even living in the same town or in any way involved with her actions, would also be hunted down and executed right alongside her. In such consequential conditions, the quantity and quality of possible motivations for her actions, including possible altruistic motives, are more delimited and more obvious, and therefore they're more easily available for examination. And though the circumstances of the crisis involved are somewhat unique, that does not mean they are irrelevant to everyday life or that the motivations involved are not commensurate with motives that could be involved in something as simple as dropping a dollar bill into a donation can. Second, crises also prod theorists to consider and examine the full implications of their assumptions about human beings in a way that would be difficult under normal circumstances. A psychologist who assumes that people are determined by fundamentally egoistic motives may feel comfortable with the implications of that assumption for behaviors like dropping coins and bills into a donation can as they walk out of the store during the holiday season. Everything from negative state relief and do good feel good theories as well as theories of public conformity with social norms can be easily invoked as egoistic theories to explain the causes of this common form of helping behavior. It is decidedly more difficult, however, to account for the helping of Jews with such theories, particularly when one considers the implications of the egoistic theory as applied to such a behavior. To say that Irena Gut rescued people over the course of many months, putting not only herself but her entire family at risk in order to avoid feeling guilty for not helping or to get a rewarding feeling for doing something good just does not hold up as easily as the behavior of dropping a dollar bill into a bucket could. This is particularly true because the SS major did eventually discover what Irena was doing, and he was furious. Irena, who knew by this time that the major had developed strong feelings for her and could not bear to turn her in, but would certainly offer no protection to the Jews she was hiding, Agreed to, this, to his, agreed to be his mistress in order to protect the people she hid. Now bear in mind, her only sexual experience to this point was the horrific trauma of being gang-raped, 
beaten and left for dead by Russian soldiers a few years earlier. You should also know that the major was three times her age. One could only imagine the negative state this acquiescence induced for her, a state made much worse by her subsequent confession to her Catholic priest, who told her that she was endangering her eternal soul and that if she did not stop the affair and turn in the juice she was hiding, then she would go to hell. A lifelong devout Catholic, Irena said of this experience with the priest more than 60 years later, that, quote, I turned around and walked out of the church and I have never gone back, end quote. Would a psychologist studying this woman and others like her in times of crisis really want to hold to the theory that she was determined to help so as to not feel guilty for not helping? Or that she helped to produce a pleasurable mood? Such an explanation is not only simplistic, it is demeaning. If the psychologist were to share this egoistic explanation with the 16 people Irena hid in that basement and fed and protected all the way through the war, how do you think they would respond? When pushed to their ultimate implications, which is what crises can do, these theories and the egoistic assumptions guiding them not only fall short, they are frankly offensive. Thus, the decisions and actions made by people like Irena in a time of crisis uniquely illuminate the full implications of psychologist theories and can prod them to consider whether they, whether they actually want to hold on to their assumptions, which is something that likely would not even occur to them in a lab or under so-called normal con conditions. Third, the actions of people during crises can also reveal more uh, clearly than might be possible in a laboratory setting the overlap of the assumptions and values of the researcher with the phenomenon being studied. Philosophers of science have long pointed out the impossibility of separating one's own values, assumptions, and beliefs from the development of hypotheses and instruments, decisions about how to analyze data, and interpretations of findings. This is especially difficult when the subject matter of concern is not directly observable, as is the case with motivations like egoism and altruism. <clears throat> when researchers seemingly bend over backwards and clearly leave the realm of empirical observation in order to make the case that the actions of a rescuer, like Irena, are motivated by selfish, even an unconsciously determined selfishness, they reveal as much if not more about them and their worldview than they do the person whose actions are being studied. Consider the example of Herbert Simon's solution to what he and many evolutionary psychologists perceive as the problem of altruism. Altruism is a problem, or at least a puzzle, for neo-Darwinists because it likely, its likely cost to the fitness of the helper would reduce their potential for reproduction and thus, from the perspective of natural selection, be irrational. Simon's solution to this conundrum is to assert that altruists operate according to an at least partly genetically inherited docility mechanism that causes them to, quote, learn and behave what they perceive others in society want them to learn and behave, end quote, including the belief that altruism is part of proper behavior. For Simon, this docility mechanism is bestowed upon the altruist and is not chosen. Therefore, it determines their altruistic behavior by bounding or limiting the altruist rationality in such a way that they fail to act for their own good as all rational actors do and should. Indeed, their rationality is so compromised that they have neither the ability nor the inclination to, quote, evaluate independently the contributions of their behavior to fitness, end quote. Moreover, argues Simon, the strong sense of guilt and shame that a docile individual will feel for violating social norms, along with the rewarding benefits they receive from their docility in other non-altruistic domains of life will satisfy egoistic needs and reinforce the docile uh, individual's acceptance of societal expe expectations of self-sacrifice. The ultimate result of this inherited docility that compromises the altruist capacity to reason properly, argues Simon, is that a society can, quote, cultivate and exploit altruism. End quote. 
And it will do this to its selective advantage over other societies. And this, he asserts, is wholly compatible with natural selection. But is it compatible with the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of altruists, particularly in times of crisis when their self-sacrifice for the benefit of others could cost them their very life? Those who have studied the rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust would clearly answer no. First and foremost, the rescuers were anything but docile. The expectations of the societies they grew up in were almost universally anti-Semitic, and legally sanctioned discrimination against Jews was common. Once under Nazi occupation, it was illegal to help Jews in any way, and rescuers were much more likely to be turned into the Nazis by members of their indigenous society for breaking the law than, being, than they would be protected by them. So in stark contrast with Simon's theory of docility and conformity, the rescuers of Jews were outliers in their societies by virtue of their defiance of social norms and laws and by virtue of their willingness to endure interrogation, torture, and execution, which, would, which could and often did ensue for them and their families. Their bold and consequential nonconformity starkly contrasts with the behavior of their non-rescuing peers, who constituted an overwhelming majority of people at the time and demonstrated far more docility in their conformity with the social norms of their society and the laws of their occupiers. Rescuers also rarely fit easily into a specific group or society anyway. They did not think, of, they did not think in terms of in-group and out-group categories, and they typically drew no distinctions between people on the basis of their group membership including, in many cases, family membership. One German rescuer named Betta used her family's food rations to feed the Jews she was hiding while she and her family would go without. Another German rescuer named Margot put her children at great risk on many occasions, including at one point being arrested by the Gestapo for rescuing behaviors right in front of her two young daughters, which resulted in them being left alone to fend for themselves for several days, not knowing if their mother would ever return. One of her daughters remains bitter toward her mother for putting strangers ahead of her own children during the war. Thus, it is unclear which, if any, group or society the rescuer's altruism would have afforded, afforded selective advantage over others. Certainly not the Jewish people who are being exterminated, or the rescuer's compatriots who are more likely to turn them in than to protect them, and definitely, definitely not their Nazi occupiers not even their own families. Their clearly non-docile behaviors fly in the face of both kinship and group selection. With such a prominent divergence between evolutionary theories of altruism, like Simon's, and the activities of rescuers during the Holocaust and in other times of crisis, it becomes all too clear that the endeavor to wrap an evolutionary narrative around the actions of the rescuers reveals more about the theorist and the theorist's commitment to evolutionary theory than it does the behavior studied. In the case of Simon's account, his assumptions are cast into bold relief, including his presumed equation of rationality with self-interest, his commitment to his docility mechanism and the suspected genes that contribute to it, his notion that altruism is determined by a gene-environment interaction and not by choice of any kind, the operation of this mechanism at an unconscious level and the presumed selective advantage to a group that protects and exploits its altruists whose capacity for reason is disabled. We learn much more about Simon and his worldview than we learn about the rescuers and their worldview, and this itself is an important benefit of studying altruism under the microscope of crisis. What I mean by this is that, this, that a study of altruism in the context of crises like the rescuing of Jews during the Holocaust not only teaches psychologists and the public about the possibility and features of this selfless motivation for human action, but it also facilitates critical thinking about the discipline of psychology itself and at a deep level, a level at which assumptions and worldviews are recognized for what they are. Implications of these assumptions can be followed to their ultimate conclusion and alternative, alternative assumptions that might better fit the phenomenon being studied can really be considered. Studies of self-interested helping behavior that assume egoism, even in a time of crisis, rarely facilitate deep critical thinking 
as easily as studies of altruism can do, because they conform to the worldview of egoism that prevails in the discipline to the point of almost being taken for granted. Think back to the example of the senators who pulled, pulled their money out of the stock market before it crashed, based on early information they learned about the coronavirus. Does this behavior need an explanation? Do you find yourself wanting to conduct a study of this behavior to better understand how it could have come about? Does it call into questions into question the assumptions of the discipline about human motivation and ethics? For many psychologists, it simply does not, because it is expected and it is, cons it is consistent with the prevailing worldview in the discipline. There may be some questions about how their self-interest prevailed in the face of social norms and potential shaming that would oppose egoism's blatant expression, but these are secondary concerns, and they themselves represent forms of self-interest, like saving face. So not only is the facet of egoism not likely going to be studied, meaning the discipline will not learn more about egoism, but this egoistic assumption that pervades our discipline is unlikely to receive the critical examination needed for disciplinary reflexivity. On the other hand, altruism's potential for facilitating critical reflexivity and thinking is one of the reasons why I have dedicated much of my career to studying and teaching altruism, especially within the context of crises like the Holocaust. Crises and altruism both act together to illuminate and magnify what might otherwise go unnoticed and unappreciated in terms of human being and in terms of disciplinary assumptions. The same can be said of agency or free will, a concept wholly bound up with altruism and one that within the context of a crisis illuminates and calls into questions the disciplinary assumption of determinism that is so easily taken for granted. Let me illustrate what I mean. It is interesting to note that the rescuers of the Jews almost univocally state that when it came to helping the Jews, they did not have a choice. Kristen Monroe, who interviewed many rescuers in great depth, goes so far as to say that for the rescuers, altruism was a reflex, not a choice. She uses her interview with Margot, the German rescuer I mentioned uh, earlier, as an example. Margot, you may recall, is the woman who had two young daughters who were left to themselves when she was first arrested. I say first arrested because Margot was ultimately arrested by the Gestapo six times over the course of the war. On one of the occasions of her arrest, the love of her life, who had nothing to do with her rescuing activities and actually had no knowledge about what she was doing at all, he went to the police to plea for her release. The Gestapo suspected him of involvement, so they interrogated him and they tortured him. And then learning nothing from him because he had nothing to offer, they beat him to death. And this is something Margot never got over. Margot also conducted a sexual affair with a Gestapo commander for the purpose of gathering information that was, was used to protect the Jews from deportation actions and to make sure their hiding places were secure. Throughout most of the war, she had to leave her daughters in the care of strangers, hoping they would not turn her daughters in to the Nazi police. This is what Margot said when Monroe asked her about her decision to do all of these things. Question, how did you decide to rescue Jews? What was the decision-making process that went through your head when you began all of this? Answer, honey, I never even thought about it. Question, you never thought about what you were doing? Answer, never gave it a thought. Question, but all this time, when you're sleeping with this guy, the Gestapo commander, when you're in prison and you don't know where your children are, surely, answer, I never gave it a thought. You never asked yourself, goes the question, why me? Why do I have to be the one? Answer, no, I only wondered about my kids. Listen, it was war, honey, and everybody died. You didn't have time to think, to count your buttons, yes or no, no way. You acted. You had to act. Margot's account would seem to fit hand in glove with determinism, confirming any number of psychological theories postulating a causal mechanism, be it the altruistic gene or altruistic personality, reciprocal altruism, negative state relief, or even empathy-induced altruism. From these perspectives, someone needed help, the mechanism was activated, and the helping behavior necessarily ensued. 
However, this is not so clear as it may appear. First, as previously discussed on the topic of Simon's docility mechanism, there is no empirical evidence for any of these mechanisms. They are assumed and used as, and used as explanatory devices by theorists who are inclined toward deterministic accounts as a feature of their scientific training and worldview. Certainly, the altruists themselves say nothing of these mechanisms. Second, the rescuers' actions took place over the course of long periods of time, usually many months and often years. None of the lab studies conducted to evidence the causal mechanism assumed by any of these deterministic theories even come close to matching this time period. They are almost always limited to one or two behaviors within a very short duration, often less than an hour. Could something studied in this short-term way, like negative state relief or reciprocity, explain the sustained, high-risk helping behavior of the rescuers over the course of such a long period of time? The in-depth interviews with rescuers, their families, and those they rescued does not support such a hypothesis. The rescuers manifested no expectation of reciprocity from the Jews they rescued during or after the war, or from the broader community, which as previously noted, was more likely to turn them in than to help them. As for the negative state relief model, none of the rescuers spoke of guilt or anticipated regret as motives, at least not as enduring and decisive motives over the full course of their rescuing. The theories of the altruistic gene or altruistic personality would seem to better fit the long duration of the rescuer's helping behavior. If altruism, if altruism is something hardwired into their brains or built into their personalities, then it would sustain their altruism for years and across various contexts. They would still be altruistic today and probably were before the war as well. We do find some evidence of this consistency but it is not sufficiently consistent to be predictive. Consider Margot once again. After the war ended, the Gestapo commander with whom she had an affair to gain information to help protect Jews, he was arrested and placed in jail. Margot was asked to come to jail to see him. When she arrived, the man begged her to help him, to explain that he was just following orders and he was not a bad person. Margot turned to his captors and immediately said, quote, I want to ask you people to kill this gentleman, end quote. And then she walked out of his cell. The next day he was hanged, and Margot went about her life expressing no compunction about her actions. Did the altruistic gene or personality mechanism turn off? Was it overridden by another mechanism? Is there really no choice in either her rescuing or in her condemnation of this man? Margot's story, like Betta's and Irena's and so many others, show how egoistic and deterministic theories of helping behavior are often stretched beyond their limits when researchers attempt to apply them to altruism in a time of crisis. And this presents the opportunity for critical reflection on the assumptions of the discipline. This critical reflection entails not only critical analysis of the deterministic assumptions as assumptions, as I have just described them, but also a consideration of the full consequences of their implications, as well as the consideration of alternative agentic assumptions. This critical examination lays bare the inevitable and problematic implication of a deterministic interpretation of the, Jewer, of the rescuer's reflexive helping, which is that the meaning of the help for the Jews who were rescued and for those who honor and celebrate the rescuers, it would have to be misplaced. To praise and feel the deepest gratitude for actions that are the naturalistic effects of a deterministic mechanism is inappropriate and irrational from within that perspective. Think about it. If a very large boulder is dislodged and rolls down a hill directly on a path toward a campsite full of people and then impacts a tree that while being uprooted happens to alter the boulder's orientation just enough so that it passes by the side of the campsite sparing all the campers. The campers might be grateful that the tree was there, but they would not be justified in attributing altruistic goodwill and intentional self-sacrifice to the tree any more than they would be justified in viewing the boulder as sadistic and murderous. Such anthropomorphisms make no sense and are clearly unwarranted. 
But ironically, so too is the anthropomorphism of the anthrope. When we understand ourselves to be more complex natural objects, but no less determined by causal mechanisms than boulders and trees. Thus, in order to maintain a deterministic assumption of altruism in the face of the rescuers of Jews would be to deny choice and intentionality, and with it the meaningfulness of their actions to those they rescued and those who honor them. Some who are concerned with this implication, like the historian Daniel Goldhagen, who wrote the best-selling book Hitler's Willing Executioners, go so far as to say that when the conventional deterministic psychological explanations of the actions of perpetrators and rescuers during the Holocaust are used, they deny their agency. And by denying their agency, they ultimately deny their humanity and the humanity of the people they either killed or saved. Are psychologists willing to accept this implication of their deterministic assumption? If so, I would challenge any psychologist committed to their assumption of determined altruism to sit down with the survivors who were rescued and with their families now in their third and fourth generations and explain to them that the behavior of the rescuer who saved their lives was really nothing more than the necessary effect of a mechanistic cause like a tree deflecting a boulder from its path. Perhaps before even contemplating such a thing, these psychologists might give alternative assumptions some consideration. In this case, the assumption of agency may better fit the rescuer's narratives and suggest implications that would not compromise the meaning of their behaviors. Agency, simply defined, is the possibility of doing otherwise, all things being equal. It may seem from the rescuers' own accounts that they did not have agency in this sense. When they encountered a Jew in peril, they indicate that they could not do otherwise than they did. They just found themselves helping in a reflexive, almost non-conscious manner. However, if we look at agency within a broader temporal context, we can see how this reflexive action is still a choice, albeit a constrained one. Consider this example. When I wake up in the morning and exit my bedroom, I will reflexively and without conscious note exit through the bedroom doorway because, as Merleau-Ponty describes it, the doorway, for socio-cultural historical reasons, is a, quote, specially favored mode of resolution. In other words, contrary to both determinism and radical or context-independent freedom, Merleau-Ponty contends that our embodiment, which entails the historical cultural situation into which we have been thrown, is the means of our freedom. Our freedom, he asserts, quote, does not destroy our situation, but gears itself to it, end quote. In other words, our agency is constrained by our situation. And these situational constraints both limit and open up possibilities for us, allowing for the possibility of doing otherwise. If one morning... When I tried to exit my bedroom through the door, as I always do, I happened to burn my hand on the doorknob, then my freedom would gear itself to that altered situation and limitations and possibilities would shift and emerge. My bedroom window, for example, might become a specially favored resolution given the constraint of a likely fire behind my bedroom door. The window was always a possible exit that could have been chosen but now it is specially favored. Similarly for the rescuers, helping others, even total strangers, at the risk of their lives and the lives of their families was, as much as it may have been statistically rare in the population at the time, and is still for many of us hard to believe, specially favored for them within the constraints of their situation. Not helping, like using the bedroom window, is always a possibility. But the rescuer's situation, like anyone's, is historical as much as it is physical and social. And in their particular history, the rescuers made choices and acted in such a way over time as to cultivate and favor the possibility of rescuing a person, even at the expense of their own safety and well-being. From her interviews of rescuers, Kristen Monroe discovered this to be the case in every case. All of the rescuers she spoke to had developed and committed themselves to a perspective of themselves in relation to others prior to their rescuing actions, 
that led to the specially favored reflexive helping behavior possibility being activated or actualized. In her words, she states that, quote, this perspective alone consistently and systematically predicts altruism among all the individuals I interviewed. It consists of a common perception held by altruists that they are strongly linked to others through a shared humanity. This self-perception constitutes such a central core to altruist identity that it leaves them with no choice in their behavior toward others. They are John Donne's people. All life concerns them. Any death diminishes them because they are a part of mankind, end quote. And yet, as Margot's request that the Gestapo commander be executed demonstrates, rescuers can and did do otherwise. Their freedom like ours, as Merleau-Ponty describes it, gears itself to the situation. And in that encounter with the Gestapo commander, whom Margot hated for his cruelty and brutality, she did otherwise than the specially favored mode of resolution of helping others. In this sense, we can appreciate that for rescuers, helping others was a choice. In this sense, we can appreciate also that that choice was made again and again over the course of many months and even years, a choice that was made as the situation changed and in many cases worsened. It was a choice that was made at great, great cost to the rescuer and the rescuer's family. They may have experienced it as reflexive, but it was a choice. It was the specially favored choice, constrained by the many choices they made over a long history that helped form their identity, their character, and their view of the world. Thus, for them, it was simply what one does. It was not extraordinary, and they certainly did not see themselves as heroes to any degree. Someone needed help, and they helped. That is all. Of course, it is not all. For those they rescued and their families, it is extraordinary and remarkable. For the organizations who honor them, like Yad Vashem, it is rare, righteous, and praiseworthy. For those who study the Holocaust, it is a shining light, a beacon in a dark and horrific time that illuminates the humanity of those who chose to sacrifice themselves and their loved ones for others. And as such, with the assumption of agency, the meaning of the rescue for the individuals and families whom the rescuer saved is not discounted or denied. What does all of this say to our current crisis? First, there can be little doubt that stories of self-interest will continue to come out as we pass through this pandemic as well as afterwards. And these stories will confirm the egoistic assumptions informing many of the theories of our discipline. Depending on how surprising or severe the self-interest is, the theories may even deepen the theorist's assumption of egoism. To the extent that laboratory studies grow out of these observations of new or at least nuanced forms of self-interest, deterministic assumptions will also be relied upon and reinforced, and the results will be interpreted in a manner that strengthens the convictions of many psychologists and the public that egoism is determined. Within this confirmatory framework of operation, critical thinking about these assumptions of the discipline will be unlikely, I would think. At the same time, stories of helping behavior will abound, as they have already, and the possibility that some of this helping behavior might be altruistic will arise and be discussed. Of course, as I have already pointed out, the position one takes on the possibility of altruism will reveal as much about their assumptions about human being as it will the behavior of the possible altruist. In light of those assumptions, some psychologists will conduct empirical laboratory studies and offer mechanisms of explanation designed to show that the apparently altruistic behaviors are actually egoistic and determined. Others, as has also occurred in the past, will conduct empirical laboratory studies and offer me mechanisms of explanation designed to show that the behavior is self-sacrificing, but still determined. Still others, like the Oliners, Kristen Monroe, and myself, will gather and examine the narratives of the potential altruists and of those they helped and analyze the narratives qualitatively with an appreciation for the importance of the phenomenon as experienced in relation to our own research questions methods and interpretations. Will these new narratives resonate with those of the rescuers of the Jews? 
now more than 75 years later? Will the same perspective of a shared humanity and the identity of oneself as responsible for others be manifest? Will the choice to help be described as reflexive? And might there be new and unexpected situational constraints involved in the current crisis to which the potential altruists have geared their freedom, as Merleau-Ponty describes it? From within my severely limited scope of study thus far, I can already see a great deal of overlap between the narratives of the rescuers and those of the potential altruists in the current, this current time of crisis. As some of you may know, my wife is a nurse, and she and her fellow float pool nurses were assigned to work with patients suffering from the COVID-19 virus as soon as hospitalizations began here in Georgia over two months ago. The first thing she and her COVID unit co-workers will tell you is that they do not see themselves as heroes at all. They are simply doing what needs to be done to get these suffering patients the care and treatment they need for their illness, which is really not any different than what they have already been doing over the course of their careers. Helping sick people is what nurses do. Yet at the, yet at the same time, these nurses are fully aware that with unproven treatments and no vaccine, they are taking great risks to their own health and the health of their families. When my wife first began working with COVID-19 patients, the unit was a ramshackle, slapdash, quickly thrown together wing of a regular medical surgical floor that like the personal protective equipment available was woefully inadequate. I remember her telling me that getting sick under these conditions was inevitable. And knowing that, a number of nurses from many of the other floors refused to take their turn on the COVID-19 floor, citing age, illness, family members with compromised immune systems, and so on. Yet the float pool nurses and a few others who stepped up had just as many reasons not to work the, the floor. One of them takes care of a son who is very sick with cancer. Others have newborn babies and small children. Still others take care of aged parents at home. Yet they have gone and continue to go into that unit every day. My wife's actually working there today. Once the nurses who refused to work the unit stepped away, it was decided by the hospital that those nurses who remained would be the only nurses working the COVID-19 unit from then on so as to control the spread of the disease. So, for day after day, this small group of nurses, and only this small group of nurses, have been treating the patients infected with coronavirus in this hospital. Even many of the doctors will not interact directly with the patients. They give the nurses a tablet, and the nurses bring it into the patient's room so the patient can consult with the doctor remotely. My wife and the other nurses on the unit do not begrudge their situation or hold ill will toward those who will not work directly with these infected patients. They do not give it any thought. They are far too busy taking care of the patients. And as they end their 13 hour shifts with their faces carrying the indentation of the respirator mask they have worn the whole time, and as they put their scrubs and shoes into plastic bags and wash and clean themselves as best they can so they do not bring that virus home with them to their families. They seek for and expect no praise from their employer and they expect no thanks from their patients, the community, or the media. They do hope not to get sick, even though they know that their risk of infection is higher than almost anyone else's on the planet. And they are especially worried about getting their families sick. My wife has told me several times, especially in the beginning when the personal protective equipment was so inadequate, that she was scared to go to work. But that has never stopped her or her co-workers. Recent pay cuts and possible furloughs due to the economic crisis faced by the hospital also have not deterred these nurses. Even the infection and death of a co-worker Due to, the due to the coronavirus, has not held these nurses back from doing this harrowing work. Yet, they deny the label of hero, and if you ask them if they are motivated by altruism, they would tell you they have never even thought about it. They do what they have always done. They help people in need of help, and they continue to do it even when the stakes are so high. Is their behavior egoistic? They are getting paid for their work, after all, even if their pay has been cut. Perhaps they could not live with themselves if they did not help their patients, 
or maybe doing their work makes them feel better. Maybe they hope for a heavenly reward after this life for their sacrifice. Is their behavior determined? They do seem to just go about doing what they are doing, as they always have, without much thought or question. Perhaps they are genetically predisposed to have a personality type that causes them to just keep helping people no matter what the risk may be. Maybe, as Simon would argue, they are excessively docile and lack the full capacity of reason to recognize what, that what they are doing is costing them and their family selective advantage. I can tell you from my wife's, from my wife's perspective, she's not excessively docile. <laughs> or maybe, as it seems obvious to me, these nurses have a perspective like the rescuers. Maybe they do not distinguish between the value of the lives of their patients and that of themselves or their families. Perhaps they have cultivated an identity over many years of living within the constraints of their socio-cultural historical context, which makes helping others, even at a considerable risk, a specially favored form of life. And even though they could do otherwise, and on some days they probably do choose to do otherwise, for the most part, on most days and nights, they get in their cars, turn the key, and drive themselves to that COVID-19 unit, and they give their patients the best care and treatment they can. After this crisis passes, whenever it passes, there will be hundreds and thousands of narratives like my wife's and her coworkers for psychologists to contend with. It may be difficult for some psychologists to face the implications of their, of their egoistic assumptions in light of these narratives that counter and challenge them. It may be even more difficult to see their assumptions as inappropriate and inadequate to altruism and agency in times of crisis, and possibly also in other times and places, including everyday contexts of life. Such lessons, if psychologists can open themselves to learning them, are learned the hard way, as they force a rethinking and possibly a change and acceptance of the limitations of their worldview. It was David Myers, the well-known author of psychology textbooks, who wrote that curiosity, skepticism, and humility are the bedrock of the scientific enterprise. I hope psychologists can be sufficiently curious about these narratives, skeptical of their own assumptions, and humble enough to be open to change, that they will allow times of crisis, as horrific and devastating as they are, to at least be opportunities for learning, for growing, and for acknowledging that we have chosen to study the most complex organism on the planet, and as such we should hold our theories, assumptions, and worldviews tentatively, reflexively, and critically, with an openness to being surprised by the revelations of our humanity that sometimes only crises can bring into full view. Thank you very much.